This is the 5 minute guide to the Slava, a pre-dreadnought of the Imperial Russian Navy. Unlike a good majority of the Russian pre-dreadnought fleet, Slava's history does not end with and was sunk at the Battle of Tsushima or was taken over by communist revolutionaries. The reason for this was that the Slava was the last of the Borodino-class pre-dreadnoughts. Unlike most Russian pre-dreadnoughts, this class was actually built in some numbers, with Slava being the fifth of the class. Borodino and Imperator Alexander III had been sunk at Tsushima, and Gnetsuvarov and Oryol had surrendered. This presented a bit of a problem, as it meant the Russian Baltic fleet had then been deprived of four of its five most modern battleships. The design was based on the French-built Cesarejevich, which we've covered in a previous video. With just under 16,000 horsepower coming from her two engines, the ship was capable of about 17.5 knots, which was a decent speed for a pre-dreadnought battleship. Although the range was fairly short, this didn't matter too much for its intended use in the Baltic Sea, although obviously if there was another attempt to send the ships all the way around the world, this would have caused a little bit more of a problem. The ship was relatively lightly armoured, with a maximum belt thickness of 7.6 inches, although unlike many pre-dreadnoughts this used the newer Krupp armour as opposed to the older Harvey Steel. Her main battery was nothing surprising for a pre-dreadnought, consisting of four 12-inch guns and two twin turrets, one forward and one aft, so so much the same. However, her secondary battery of 6-inch guns were contained in their own twin turrets, with a total of 12 guns contained in 6 turrets, three on each wing. A tertiary battery of 23-inch casemate-mounted guns completed the primary offensive armament, although four 47mm saluting guns and four small-caliber torpedo tubes were also present. The layout of the secondary and tertiary armament was a little bit unusual for a pre-dreadnought, as most pre-dreadnoughts with a 6-inch secondary battery tended to have those guns in casemates and the lighter guns in open mounts. Although this meant the secondary battery was much more usable than many of her contemporaries, the tertiary battery was mounted worryingly low. This was demonstrated by the Imperator Alexander III, which, prior to Tsushima, had made a high-speed turn during her trials, heeled over, and begun taking water through the lower casements, which is obviously not a good thing. In the course of her life, only minor armament changes would be made, with two of the torpedo tubes removed before the outbreak of the First World War, and reports indicating that two 47mm anti-aircraft guns were installed at some point during World War I, but by the end of her career she was only carrying four 3-inch anti-aircraft guns. The casement battery had also been reduced to 12 guns, mainly by taking out those that were worst affected by high water. Completed in October 1905, as we mentioned earlier, she was too late to participate in the Russia-Japanese War. Instead, she joined her predecessor, Cesarievich, in suppressing a rebellion in 1906. After this, she spent the bulk of her time in the Mediterranean, mainly as a training ship on cruising missions, but occasionally helping out with relief for major natural disasters. This all came to an end in 1910, when she suffered a serious boiler accident, and had to be towed to Gibraltar by Cesarievich, before tech being towed to France for further repairs. Although these took over a year to complete, the ship was back in service, transferred to Kronstadt, and taken back into the Baltic fleet. Due to the losses of the Russia-Japanese War, by the time World War I began, the Baltic fleet only had four pre-dreadnoughts of any value. Although the four Gangut class dreadnoughts were almost finished, they were not yet in service. Fortunately for the Russians, the High Seas Fleet didn't try any major offensive operations in the first couple of years of the war, and so the Ganguts were completed, sent to guard the Gulf of Finland, and Slava was reallocated to defend the Gulf of Riga. Less than a week later, the High Seas Fleet did in fact try something, and the Battle of the Gulf of Riga developed. Fighting alone, except for a couple of gunboat escorts, the Slava would be engaged first by the German pre-dreadnoughts Elsass and Braunschweig, and then later by the dreadnoughts Nassau and Posen. Although hit with three 11-inch shells in the latter engagement, the Slava was not seriously damaged, and the Germans withdrew after the battlecruiser Moltke was torpedoed by a British submarine. In the absence of enemy capital ships, Slava then proceeded with her mission to bombard German positions. 
This was unsurprisingly rather unpopular with the Germans, who attempted to engage her with various calibres of field artillery, repeatedly tried to bomb her with seaplanes, and attempted an ambush using a small submarine and several low-flying torpedo bombers, this latter being the first attack by torpedo bombers against a moving battleship, but no serious damage was inflicted by any of these assaults. However, by October 1917, the Russian army was in retreat and the Germans were back on the offensive. Slava, along with the armoured cruiser Bayan and the older pre-dreadnought Grazdanin, were engaged by the much more modern German dreadnoughts Koenig and Kronprinz. In the first engagement, Slava actually forced the two German dreadnoughts to retreat single-handed as she engaged them while they were passing through a very narrow channel swept through a minefield. However, as the day wore on, German minesweepers cleared more of the minefield and the dreadnoughts re-engaged, with Slava's forward turret being inoperable due to a mechanical fault that had developed. She was hit five times and badly damaged and forced to withdraw. Unfortunately, the damage had increased her draft to a point that she couldn't actually use the channel she'd used to come in on to escape by. And so, after the rest of the fleet had passed, she was ordered to scuttle herself in the channel entrance in order to block the Germans' advance. However, a sailors' committee organised after the February Revolution had decided they were going to abandon the engine room and so the ship grounded on a shoal instead because there was no one around to actually stop the ship. A combination of an exploding rear magazine and a torpedo hit from destroyers trying to scuttle her would eventually send the Slava to the bottom of the shallow water. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to tag your question with Q&A if you want to leave a question for the dry dock.